And, okay, so this next speaker is Professor Kendrick Smith, also from the Perman Institute. And he's going to talk about Ch the, the FRB science results from Chime. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, can everyone see the slides? <laughs> I see your slides. They're full screen. Perfect. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kendrick. I'm a cosmologist at a Perimeter Institute, but I've also been uh, dabbling in observational radio astronomy. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the FRB science results in the last few years from the CHIME telescope. And uh, let me start by um, acknowledging my collaborators. CHIME is a collaboration with large teams at the four institutions shown in the top and smaller teams at the bottom institutions, including Perimeter Institute. Um, so I want to start by introducing the CHIME instrument. Uh, CHIME is a compact interferometer with no moving parts. It just sits on the sky and stares, uh, except for one universal moving part, namely the Earth, um, which rotates and sweeps the CHIME beam over the sky once per day. Uh, CHIME consists of four cylindrical reflectors. Uh, you can't see them in the picture, but each of the feed lines running over the center of the cylinder is instrumented with 256 uh, antennas. Um, for a total of 1,024 feeds in the system. Uh, the total collecting area is 80 meters on a side, comparable to a large radio telescope like GBT or Parks. Uh, Chime observes in radio frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. Uh, that range was originally selected for 21 centimeter cosmology for observing the 21 centimeter line in the so-called uh, redshift desert. Uh, but fortunately, that happens to be a very interesting uh, radio frequency range for other things like FRBs. Uh, and uh, CHIME has many science goals and describing them all would take a long time, but most of our science results so far have been on FRBs and that's all I'll talk about in this talk. Um, so I want to uh, compare the CHIME design to a traditional uh, radio telescope, which uh, at cartoon level looks like a single feed sitting in front of a big dish. Uh, the traditional radio telescope focuses by physical delays. Um, it, when a bundle of rays comes in from the focus direction, um, then uh, the path lengths to the feed are the same and you get constructive interference. And if the bundle of rays was coming in from a different direction, you, you wouldn't get constructive interference and you'd be out of focus. Um, now I want to imagine getting rid of the dish in this picture and replacing it by um, simulating in software instead. And uh, what I mean by that is you replace the, um, the plane of the dish um, by a sequence of antennas and you digitally record the electric field at each of those locations. And uh, then you can process those digital time streams arbitrarily. And in particular, you could imagine summing them with a pattern of time delays, which mimics the optics of an arbitrarily pointed dish. Uh, and uh, in this picture, you, you, would, you could repoint the telescope by changing the pattern of delays, which is applied. Uh, now you might wonder what you would gain by this. And uh, what you gain is something very powerful. Uh, if, if you have enough computational power, uh, you can repeat the computation n times in parallel uh, because digital time streams may be, once you digitize, you may copy the time streams uh, freely without destroying information. And so the observing power of the instrument increases by a factor of n. You become equivalent to n single dish telescopes pointing in different directions. Uh, and so uh, it might sound uh, too good to be true, but uh, for most purposes, it is true that the raw sensitivity of Chime is the same as you know, 1,024 large research class single feed radio telescopes all pointed in slightly different directions. Uh, 1,024 because that's the number of independent beams with 1,024 antennas. Um, so, uh, so that um, I want to, to uh, keep this picture in mind of how Chime observes throughout the talk. Um, so um, the so-called primary beam of Chime or the uh, uh, pattern on the sky that any single antenna in the system would see um, is a cylinder, is a narrow strip because the cylinder is focused in one direction but unfocused in the other. Uh, and then uh, by um, beam, by software beamforming, uh, summing things up with appropriate delays as previously described, uh, we can form 1024 software beams about a third of a degree in size that tile the primary beam. Uh, and then this pattern of primary beam and formed beams um, remains fixed in the coordinate system of the telescope, but uh, sweeps over the sky with the rotation of the earth. 
Uh, so every 24 hours, we image the sky with an angular resolution of around a third of a degree. That's the size of the formed beams. Um, so now from everything that I've said so far, you might uh, surmise, and uh, this is uh, roughly right, uh, that uh, the statistical power of a telescope is proportional to its mapping speed, uh, which I've defined schematically as the collecting area of the telescope. That's setting the sensitivity per beam. Um, multiplied by the number of beams that you, the number of independent beams that you can form or the number of beams you can afford to compute, whichever is uh, smaller. Um, times some order one factors omitted in this back of the envelope comparison, things like system temperatures, bandwidths, and so on. And so with this crude definition of mapping speed and in some funny units that no one actually uses, uh, chime is comparable to fast uh, and uh, significantly larger than the other um, famous radio telescopes on that list. Uh, but um, if you think about what this is saying, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Here are FAST and CHIME compared to scale. Uh, FAST is you know, one of the most uh, ambitious projects in radio astronomy. It's a 500 meter telescope. And, uh, and uh, CHIME is this you know, grassroots effort by comparison uh, built entirely in Canada on a few percent of the budget. Um, so uh, I got interested in this project a few years ago because I was just wondering whether this could really be true. Uh, it seemed uh, too good to be true, but the comparison on the previous slides, calculation on the previous slides seemed too simple to be wrong. So I, what's going on? Uh, and so there is, a, there is a catch, or I'll call it a challenge, uh, which is that um, the table from the previous slide, in the table from the previous slide, you should interpret the product of A and N as statistical power in principle under the, the assumption of infinite computing power. Uh, but the computational cost is proportional to N since that's what's setting the total data volume. Uh, and uh, if you're just thinking about the product of A and N, then it looks much cheaper to increase N. Uh, increasing A requires you know, buying a huge amount of steel and um, you know, supports and so on. Building huge telescopes is really expensive. Increasing N is just a matter of adding a few cheap antennas and, and some cheap cables. Uh, but uh, that's the, that, that is, a, in fact, a strategy for moving difficulty from hardware to software. And uh, in Chime, we face uh, computing challenges that are orders of magnitude more, expen more difficult than uh, these other telescopes. Um, so behind every, each of our science goals in Chime, we have a hard computing problem. And there's one hard computing problem that we've really crushed, and that is the FRB search problem. Uh, so uh, I could give a whole hour talk talking about all of the, um, you know, technical innovations that went into this. Um, but after a couple of years of effort um, by, um, you know, a few really dedicated people, uh, we've come up with an FRB search algorithm that I would say is, so I'm describing the core part of the search, the real time uh, RFI flagging and the so-called D-dispersion transform that detects the FRBs, uh, which is um, you know, several orders of magnitude faster than um, previously existing packages, uh, near statistically optimal, and um, uh, runs in real time with low latency. And uh, most importantly of all, um, does, uh, re removes the need for human intervention and can be completely automated. Um, by removing human-made radio transmissions from the data in real time uh, with, a, with um, very high fidelity classification. Um, so uh, that's all I want to say introducing Chime, since I mostly want to talk about the science results. Uh, I also have a few slides of um, like FRB mini introduction, which I think is sort of redundant with the other FRB talks, but I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, so an FRB is a... Uh, Bright, short, highly dispersed radio pulse. Uh, dispersed means that the arrival time is, uh, depends on, on the frequency channel uh, in such a way that the delay is proportional to frequency to the minus two. And uh, the coefficient of that dispersion relation uh, is a measurement of, this, of the dispersion measure, or DM, which is the um, line of sight integral of the electron density. And uh, I've gotten hardwired to use weird radio astronomy units, parsecs per cubic centimeter, which are natural if you think of the line of sight as measured in parsecs and the electron density in uh, uh, inverse cubic centimeters. Um, and uh, around 100 FRBs have been reported so far, starting with the first detection in 2013. Uh, internally in Chime, we have over 1,000, and I'll talk about that catalog a bit. 
Uh, so uh, when you measure an FRB, the DM is very well uh, observed, but you don't directly get to measure a redshift. As far as we know, FRBs don't have spectral lines. Um, but uh, if, you, if you measure the FRB at very high angular resolution, uh, then you will be able to associate the FRB with a unique galaxy and measure the redshift of that galaxy in optical or infrared. And uh, that has been done in a few examples as shown here in the lower uh, right. Um, and uh, you know, with 10 points in the redshift DM plane, it looks like FRBs are cosmological and that the DM is a reasonable distance indicator. And uh, the implication of this is that FRBs are ultra energetic um, you know, many orders of magnitude brighter than the brightest radio pulses that have ever been observed from well understood sources in our galaxy. And uh, that is why the problem of explaining the origin of FRBs is so interesting and has become a central, I'd say, a central unsolved problem in astrophysics. Uh, these, um, there's uh, not really a, a, a known mechanism for generating these uh, ultra bright pulses. Um, it's suggesting that there's um, you know, some new, new phenomenon to be discovered. Um, the last thing to say in my mini introduction is uh, repeaters. Uh, so uh, prior to Chime, one FRB had been observed to repeat, and uh, we've now found many more repeaters in Chime. Uh, and uh, it's an open question in the field as to whether uh, all FRBs repeat at some level or whether repeating and non-repeating FRBs are different types of objects. And uh, for what it's worth, um, a recent poll at an online conference found that audience members were nearly 50-50 divided on this question. Um, here's my theory slide, which is like really bad. Uh, all I wanna say with this slide is that uh, the number of theories that have been proposed to explain FRBs is so large that people have uh, written papers to, classify, to, to catalog uh, all of the theories that have been proposed. Um, Okay, so with that introduction, I want to move on to talking about the uh, the FRB science results from Chime. And uh, in this talk, I won't get to talk about everything. I've picked the results that I see as being uh, our highlights, and they're in roughly chronological order. Uh, so uh, the first highlight, I would say, just from the um, you know be, the moment that we turned the instrument on, we found that FRBs were very common at low frequencies. Uh, one of our risks early on in the project uh, was that. Prior to Chime, almost all FRBs um, had been uh, detected at 1.4 gigahertz. That's just a common frequency to use in radio astronomy since it's the 21 centimeter one. Uh, with the exception of a few at the upper end of the Chime band, uh, and uh, all searches at frequencies lower than Chime, let's say 200 and below, had been unsuccessful. Uh, and so uh, prior to Chime, the data suggested a spectral cutoff, uh, but we were, um, uh, relieved to see when we turned on Chime, right away we started finding um, uh, bright FRBs. And uh, there, there seems, and there's no real preference for the FRB being brighter at the upper end of the band. Like about half of them are brighter at the top, about half of them are brighter in the bottom. And uh, I should say that this slide is a little out of date uh, in that uh, uh, recently there have been FRBs observed at order 100 megahertz um, in LOFAR. Um, a minor comment, it's kind of obvious, but I'll say it anyway, is that throughout the talk, when I show FRBs, as in the lower right, um, I'm showing them de-dispersed after removing the one over frequency squared delay. Um, another sort of, you know, another thing that was sort of immediately obvious from chime data is that repeating FRBs are common. Um, in the first um, in the first year or so of our data, uh, we found um, uh, 18 different repeating FRBs. Um, in a few of these cases, I should say um, the classification as a repeater is a bit of a judgment call. Um, in particular, for the uh, first repeater on the list, the one in the first repeater in the table labeled R3, uh, the, um, the observed DM of the FRB is uh, 350. And uh, to decide whether that's an extragalactic FRB or a galactic source, uh, we compare to a model for the um, uh, maximum DM of the FRB of the of the galaxy um, obtained by you know integrating a model all the way out to the edge of the galaxy, and uh, in this case you get either two hundred or three twenty five depending on which of two popular models you choose. Um, for other for uh, and we do actually know that this uh, object R three we do actually know now that it's extragalactic. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but for most of the FRBs on this list, the um, 
there's no ambiguity. The observed DM is much larger than the galactic estimates. Um, Another thing we saw right away is that uh, the so-called downward marching pulse structure, sometimes uh, the term sad trombone is used in the FRB field, uh, is uh, observed for many repeating FRBs. Um, so uh, the plot on the left is a high signal to noise um, observation of the original repeater from the Arecibo telescope, um, showing this, this sort of uh, subpulse structure which marches down in frequency and time. Uh, and uh, we saw you know, something similar in the first uh, new repeater that we discovered. Uh, so this phenomenon is explained in, in different ways in different models and is uh, uh, you know, sort of influential. It's a hint for the FRB physics. Um, a particular repeating FRB, uh, R3, um, is uh, interesting in chime and uh, showed a new phenomenon, namely periodic activity. Um, so the, uh, the low DM of this object, as I explained a few slides ago, um, its uh, DM puts it just outside of the galaxy, uh, suggests that it's at low redshift. Um, now, even if you restrict your search to low redshift galaxies, the chime angular resolution is not quite good enough to localize R3 to a unique host galaxy. Um, so we can't do it in Chime, but what we do is uh, like outsource our um, localization by partnering with VLBI telescopes. So we partnered with the uh, European VLBI network uh, to observe R3. And um, after some observing, uh, we successfully observed pulses. And uh, the EVN resolution is fantastic. It's more than good enough to get a host galaxy. Um, so we know that this... Um, this object R3 is uh, in a spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way at a redshift of around 0.03. And uh, we even know that it went off in this little star forming region in the disk of the galaxy. Um, something really interesting about this object is that uh, we observe periodic activity. Um, so um, uh, this was first noticed by Dong Zhe Li, at the, who at the time was a grad student in China. Um, the, uh, the plot in the in the plot shown here, uh, the red triangles represent the days when we saw pulses from R three, and uh, you know Chime observes every point on the sky once per day, uh, so the gaps in between the red triangles we observed it, but we didn't see pulses, and uh, the gray bands are not something that's observed. Uh, we just noticed that if you put down this um, sequence of gray bands with a particular spacing that uh, we only see pulses in the periodically spaced gray bands. Uh, so there's some, uh, now as far as we can tell, uh, when the FRB is active, the arrival time of the pulses is random. There's no, at least as far as we can tell, there's no periodicity uh, during an activity period. Um, but the periods of time when the FRB uh, is active um, are periodic. Um, the statistical significance of the statement is um, easy enough to assess that it fits into a single line. Uh, for, a um, for a fixed, uh, if you fix the choice of gray bands, um, then uh, the probability that you would get the red triangles in the gray bands by chance uh, is four over 16.35 to the 11, uh, because there are uh, you know, 11 um, uh, batches of um, red triangles. And uh, for each one, the probability of being in the gray band is um, the width of the gray band, that's four days, divided by the spacing between the bands, that's 16.35. And then uh, the thing that's um, a little trickier is deciding what trial factor to multiply by. And so uh, that's just the number of ways of choosing the space, the number of independent ways of choosing the spacings between the bands and their phase once the spacing is chosen. And so, uh, Omitting the details of that counting, the trial factor is something like 270, which leads to a p-value of around five times 10 to the minus five. Um, so this uh, observation was a new phenomenon and uh, you know, in different models it arises because the uh, activity of the FRB is coupled in some way to like the rotation or uh, aberration period of a neutron star. Um, the ch a chime observation that I personally think is just super interesting are the giant pulses that we observed from a known galactic magnetar. So I'll spend a few slides talking about that. Um, so uh, 
Let me remind you that FRB, the reason why FRBs are a puzzle and so interesting in the first place is that FRBs are much brighter than the brightest pulses that have ever been observed from neutron stars in the Milky Way. Uh, on uh, April of last year, um, I should update the slide. It should now say 2020, April 28th. Um, uh, Chime observed two pulses from a known magnetar with an energy that closes most of the gap. So it's, these pulses are closer in energy to the faintest FRBs than they are to the brightest previously known pulses. Uh, we actually saw two pulses uh, separated by in time by about 30 milliseconds. And uh, the event was also observed by two other telescopes. The first pulse was seen by the a ARO telescope in Ontario. And the second pulse was uh, observed by the STAIR-2 telescope, which is run at, at Caltech. Um, as previously mentioned, this closes um, most of the energy gap between galactic pulses and FRBs. Uh, this is a nice plot from the STAIR-2 paper uh, showing that um, this object is a little uh, less luminous than the faintest FRBs that have been observed, but it's you know, closer to the uh, FRB part of the plot than anything else. Um, an aspect of these observations that I think is quite, so let me say that I personally think it's fair to classify this event as an FRB. Um, if, we had, if we had seen a pulse with this luminosity in a nearby galaxy, say M81 or M82, uh, I'll get back to that later. Um, then uh, we, would, we would classify it as an FRB, um, or if our telescopes were a little bit more sensitive. Um, so uh, this is just my interpretation, but I think this shows that at least a fraction of the total FRB population is due to giant pulses from magnetars. Um, here's an aspect of these observations that I think is, is super interesting. Um, so uh, magnetars are active in X-ray. And uh, several X-ray telescopes uh, were observing um, uh, the sky near uh, SGR 1935 at the time that we saw the pulses and observed X-ray pulses that were coincident with the radio pulses. Uh, so this is an observational milestone since it's uh, the first and still only uh, situation where an FRB pulse was um, also showed up outside the radio. Um, now I want to talk about the arrival time lag at the time difference between the, uh, the radio pulses and the X-ray pulses. And uh, uh, I've def I define the lag, I define the radio arrival time so that it's the um, uh, arrival time that you would see if there were no dispersion. Uh, and uh, I've um, defined it in a way where L is positive if the radio pulses arrive after the X-ray. Uh, now, that's what you would expect in uh, most models. You'd expect the radio to lag the X-ray. And uh, I may be out of date since there are so many theories. Uh, but as far as I know, it's still true uh, that uh, all of the magnetar models for FRBs um, predict that L should be positive, that the radio pulses should arrive after the X-ray pulses. Um, so it was very puzzling when the first reported X-ray pulses um, reported an X-ray arrival time that was after the radio, or in other words, negative L. Um, here's a plot from the integral paper with the um, uh, chime pulses uh, shown in orange at the bottom, uh, de-dispersed. Um, and uh, you can see that the radio pulses are arriving a little bit afterwards. Pulses, peaks one and two in their plot. Um, now, um, I should say that uh, as far as I know, uh, theory papers who have interpreted this result uh, have all interpreted it as saying that the radio and X-ray pulses arrive at the same time. Uh, but uh, you know, that's not quite what we see. As far as uh, we can tell, uh, the radio pulses are arriving first. Uh, now, there may be some, uh, there may be a good reason to interpret things um, as simultaneous or inconclusive. Um, there's a little more to the story. Uh, as I've shown in this plot, so, so in this plot, I've collected all of the arrival time results. Um, the uh, blue results are, the blue arrival times are the radio arrival times. Uh, the statistical errors are very small 
And uh, impressively, the stair two uh, arrival time agrees with the chime arrival time within those tiny statistical errors. Uh, the, in, the red results are the X-ray results. Uh, so integral came first, uh, and uh, they find, as shown here, that the X-ray um, pulses appear to arrive after the radio pulses. Uh, the next experiment to report was uh, Insight. Uh, the next X-ray experiment to report was Insight HXMT, um, which reported arrival times which are consistent within chi-squared statistics of the integral results uh, and increased the statistical significance of L being less than zero to around eight and a half sigma. Uh, however, there was a third uh, X-ray experiment to report, uh, Conus Wind, uh, which found earlier arrival times uh, that are very close to the chime and stair two values. Uh, but uh, Conus Wind, uh, uh, as far as I know, has not reported error bars on those arrival times. Uh, so one way to, and according to my reading of that paper, they were just mainly uh, thinking about other things like the energy spectrum of the FRB. Um, and uh, just not so concerned with the arrival times. Um, so you might choose to interpret this plot as saying that the scatter in the X-ray measurements is larger than the statistical errors, uh, suggesting uh, undiagnosed systematics or an inconclusive result. Uh, or you might choose to interpret this plot uh, by uh, throwing away the conus wind points because they don't have error bars or you know, assuming that the error bars are large and uh, giving all the statistical weight to the other two experiments, in which case you would say that uh, there is a very high significance detection of negative L, which would be extremely constraining for the uh, models. Um, okay. Uh, if that wasn't enough interesting stuff, I have even more interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, next up is uh, an, a very nearby FRB associated with uh, the M81 galaxy. Um, so, um, the lowest, the FRB in Chime uh, with the lowest extragalactic DM um, is a repeating FRB that we've observed three bursts from. Uh, so it's, uh, it's observed DM is uh, 88. Uh, the Milky Way estimate in, the, in uh, the appropriate direction is around 40. And the, the two popular models do agree quite well on that. Uh, I should also say that, um, there's a lot of debate in the literature about the DM associated with the Milky Way halo. Uh, different authors estimate the uh, DM of the Milky Way halo along, a, um, it's, it's fairly independent of the direction, um, as being anywhere from around 10 to around 100. Uh, so if this FRB were outside the Milky Way halo, that would actually um, disfavor most of the halo models. Um, now in Chime, we, uh, we thought and we re reported uh, that this FRB was in the M81 galaxy. Uh, since the uh, chance of a, um, it's very close to M81 and the chance of that being a coincidence is small. Um, it's something on the order of 10 to the minus two uh, where um, I'm being a bit vague about the p-value because uh, uh, the precise value depends on detailed treatment of trial factors. Um, if you assume that this FRB is in M81, then it has a similar luminosity as the SGR 1935 uh, giant pulses we saw. So this may just you know, be the same mechanism in a nearby galaxy. Um, M81 is one of the closest nearby galaxies. It's around three megaparsecs away, um, but it's more, this event is more distant than the SGR 1935 pulse by about, about a factor of a thousand. So it shows up as being 10 to the six times fainter. Um, Three days ago, there was a, a paper posted to the archive that um, successfully localized uh, this FRB in uh, BLBI with the European BLBI network, um, who found that uh, uh, indeed the FRB is in the M81 galaxy and more specifically in a globular cluster around 10 to the 10 years old uh, uh, associated with M81. Um, I haven't, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, a very new paper, so I haven't had the chance to, uh, you know, think carefully about the implications. Uh, it does strike me as surprising that uh, you would find an FRB in a globular cluster where the rate of neutron star production is, an old globular cluster, where the rate of neutron star production is um, presumably quite low. Um, so that'll be, uh, and, you know, very interesting to think about. Um, so finally, the last, um, 
uh, chime result that I want to talk about are some results from our um, catalog paper, um, which um, is in the late stages of refereeing and should appear in the archive soon. But it can, uh, so it's not really public yet, but I can say a few things about it. Uh, so the first Chime FRB catalog paper uh, is reporting on a, a catalog of 492 total FRBs, uh, 18 of which are repeating FRBs. Uh, in the left, you can see the sky distribution, which is uh, very anisotropic and peaked near the North Celestial Pole. And uh, that's just because of the observing strategy of Chime. Uh, we are, as we rotate, we're always observing the North Celestial Pole. Um, but we observe other points on the sky less frequency, frequently. Um, this is a huge number of FRBs, which increases the total number found to date by about a factor of four. Uh, as another way of showing off the power of uh, Chime, in the plots on the right, I've shown uh, the number of FRBs, the total number of FRBs discovered per year uh, with Chime uh, excluded in the top or Chime included in the bottom. Uh, internally, we have a lot more FRBs than this that you know, we've discovered but aren't in our catalog yet. Um, it took us a long time to get this paper out. And uh, the reason it's so difficult is that, uh, you know, even to interpret something that seems simple, like a histogram of uh, DMs, uh, you, you would want to know if you're doing statistics with a lot of events, uh, then you would want to know how that plot is affected by the selection function of the telescope. Uh, in other words, uh, if there were a random FRB with a given DM, what's the probability that we would observe it? Uh, and uh, so um, most of the catalog paper is actually um, talks about the technical details of doing that. And our, our main tool is a Monte Carlo approach uh, where we inject simulated pulses in the real FRB search. Uh, so they uh, are injected into a realistic RFI environment and go through all, all the flagging and classification and so on of our real pipeline. Um, and so as a result, we uh, you know, now have selection function corrected um, population statistics for many FRB parameters, like uh, the flux, the frequency spectrum, uh, the D, of course, the DM, uh, the uh, scattering time, and the intrinsic width. Um, it's a bit technical, but I want to just clearly distinguish between two parameters that control the, the pulse width of an FRB, uh, the scattering time, and the intrinsic width. Um, so a good model for the pulse profile of an FRB um, is to assume that uh, uh, in the rest frame of the FRB, uh, the pulse is emitted with a Gaussian time dependence, uh, and the width of that Gaussian W uh, is independent of, of frequency. Uh, so that's what we call the intrinsic width. Uh, and then as that pulse propagates to us, uh, well, there are two main effects, or, well, there are several effects, two of which are uh, the dispersion, which I already talked about, uh, and uh, so-called scattering, uh, which is uh, multi-path propagation through the an inhomogeneous plasma, um, broadens the observed pulse. And uh, the way that broadening works is that you can evolve the pulse with an exponential, um, whose uh, width um, grows very rapidly with decreasing frequency. Um, so it grows as something like the, uh, the width of the exponential um, is something like frequency to the minus four, uh, where tau 600 is the um, defined to be the width at 600 megahertz, the middle of the chime band. Um, so we, because we have a wide bandwidth, we can uh, uh, independently measure the intrinsic width W and the scattering time tau. Okay, so- Are, um, are you close to finishing? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I just have maybe four or five more slides. Four or uh, five, I'll try and go quickly so we can answer questions. Okay, how, how much time do I have left? Well, you have about three minutes, two minutes, something like that. Oh, okay, okay, all right. I, so I wasn't just... stopping you before because it looked like you were coming to the end. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So let me just um, try to go through this quickly. Um, so the uh, FRB luminosity function or the number of pulses above some minimum flux S um, is uh, we find to be a power law whose exponent is consistent with the Euclidean expectation uh, S to the minus three halves that you would get in a non-expanding universe with a, a non-evolving population. Um, we uh, have a constraint on the overall, a measurement of the overall sky rate, which is about a thousand FRBs per day above our completeness limit, which is consistent with other uh, experiments, but measured a little bit better. Um, 
we, there is uh, good evidence in our data for a population of FRBs with very high scattering time, most of which we don't detect. If we correct for our selection function, we see way more events at high scattering than you would think you, we would see with our selection function. Is this a sound way of saying it? Um, we compare the statistics of repeaters and non-repeaters and find that for most parameters, the uh, population distributions are the same. Uh, but the exceptions are the intrinsic width, uh, where uh, repeaters are wider, uh, and the, the spectral bandwidth of the FRBs, where uh, repeaters are narrower. They tend to be um, occupy a fraction of our frequency band, whereas non-repeaters tend to fill the whole range. Um, sadly, due to my poor, my poor time management, I can barely talk about the exciting stuff that we're doing in the future. Uh, we are building uh, outrigger, teles outrigger telescopes for time. Uh, so that uh, we can do VLBI for most or all CHIME FRBs. Um, when, a, when, when an FRB is observed in uh, CHIME, we um, trigger the outrigger telescopes, which are like little miniature copies of CHIME, to dump their data to disk. And then we can uh, get, the, um, yeah, get the data today together afterwards to do a VLBI analysis and figure out where the FRB goes off. And uh, so it'll be really amazing when you know, you know, CHIME observes a few FRBs per day, and in the near future, we'll be uh, able to localize those uh, few FRBs per day to host galaxies. That'll just be exceptionally powerful. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'm excited to say that very recently CORD was funded. CORD is like a super chime, which is you know the uh, next next big telescope that we're building, uh, where uh, we're hoping to improve chime on a number of fronts uh, to end up with an effective mapping speed that's around eight times higher than chime. And uh, CORD will have VLB uh, outriggers from the start. Um, so with CORD, you know, we might be um, have catalogs of something like 10 to the four or 10 to the five FRBs um, by on a you know on a time scale of a few years. Uh, most of which will be localized to host galaxies. Um, so the um, even things that applications of FRBs, you know, some of the other speakers were talking about that require these huge numbers. Um, that uh, seem seem like they might be futuristic are uh, are are not that far away, and uh, the field is um, evolving really quickly. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Kendrick. Now let's see if we have the time I was saving questions. Let's see if people have questions or comments. Come on, don't be shy. We're, we're saving a little bit of time here before we're gonna switch over to the discussion section. So Kendrick, I'll ask you a question to get them started. And you were mentioning the computation. Uh, did, you, uh, did you have an idea? You came in where you were doing the fitting for the stuff at a, for looking for the FRBs, but earlier than that was the actual reconstruction. Do you know what the power you know what what the power is in that system and how it goes. Um, what do you mean by the, what do you mean by the power? Or, or like well, what? Okay, I'll, I'll add, this was a question that was came from one of the reviews I did of the of the square kilometer array, where people wanted to do not just you know not dishes but just separate antennas and do uh -huh. the the really large number of cross correlations and the power budget. Would have been half the budget of the the operating budget of the equipment, you know, of the of running SK. But now we have questions from Pawan and Huri. So let's start with Pawan. Um, I will say briefly that Chime is around three hundred kilowatts, and the power budget is significant. Okay, Pawan, would you have a question? You're muted, Pawan. Um, so can you address uh, whether according to Chime, all the 18 repeaters that you have found, they all have this frequency down drift, every single one of them, and whether you see the frequency down drift for any non-repeaters in your catalog? There are definitely, um, it's, I think neither of the statements is true as a blanket statement. Uh, there are examples of non-repeaters that show the downward marching. But um, on the other hand, um, just because we haven't seen it repeat yet doesn't mean it's not a repeater. Um, 
And uh, not every repeating FRB shows the downward marching structure. Um, in fact, I can think of, I, I, I randomly remember at least one pulse from a repeater in Chime that marches upward. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but the downward marching structure is, uh, is um, definitely much more frequently occurring and it occurs more in repeaters than non-repeaters. What about the polarization um, property? I will say that there's a, there's a nice paper um, by um, Ziggy um, Plunis, a uh, uh, graduating PhD student in China. Um, that's um, being refereed about, uh, the, uh, I think would be perfect for answering those questions that talks about the different categories of pulse structure that we see and gives probabilities for each and uh, dissects them by repeater versus non repeater What about the polarization property? Um, do you see any clear difference between the polarization properties for repeaters versus non-repeaters? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, one, um, so the first statement that comes to mind is that um, one of the most interesting results about the first repeater, as I'm sure you know, um, before Chime came out, uh, was that uh, it had, um, you know, an enormous amount of Faraday rotation uh, in its linear polarization, um, which, you know, suggested a, a, a very highly magnetized environment. And uh, we haven't seen that yet in any of our repeaters. Uh, our repeaters tend to have, um, you know, uh, Faraday rotation on the order of what you would expect from the from the Milky Way. Um, you know, the Milky Way plus the host galaxy containing the FRB. Um, so that's um, um, the 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 first discovered repeater R one um, appears to be an outlier in several respects, and and uh, that's one of them. So I wasn't um, asking you about R M, um, as you say. I know. I know RM property. There is a, a more recent burst which also has a high RM, but I wasn't asking about RM at all. I was really asking you about the polarization. Uh, the first repeater, not only the first repeater, but several other repeaters are nearly 100% linearly polarized. Ah, and right. My question was the, the, the 18 repeaters in your sample. Are they all 100% linearly polarized or not? Uh, no, they're not all like 100%. Um, I, I, uh, I'm not sure about, um, you're asking about polarization differences between repeaters and non-repeaters. And I have to admit, I, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure about the answer to that one. I would need to check. Okay, we're getting a little bit late. Let's, let me ask Corey for- I have a short question. Hello, thank you for, for the talk. Uh, I just would um, like to know if uh, you, you can detect any, um, uh, Chime can detect any uh, signature if the emission is coherent. Uh, I mean, a sort of laser, maser types, if you like. Hmm. Um, so uh, if the FRB, FRBs are usually um, stated to be coherent, uh, because the required brightness temperature for incoherent emission would be above the Planck temperature. Um, so just, just from their observed brightness and the fact that they're cosmological, um, I think incoherent emission is, um, is ruled out. That's um, uh, Beyond that, I'm not aware of uh, anything that we could observe that would, um, would be like addition, evidence for a specific coherent mechanism. Okay, thanks. Okay, Elias, you had a question or you want to transition this to the discussion section? I had a question, if that's okay, but I can ask it also later. Well, if... Go ahead and ask and then we'll, try, then we'll hand off the chair. <laughs> uh, my question is, is quite simple and naive. Uh, we have seen uh, FRBs coming from magnetars. What other sources are known for FRBs? If I remember Pavan, mentioned that the accretion disks of black holes don't uh, seem to be um, sending FRB. So what else do we know? This would, may I suggest that uh, we um, have this question in the discussion. Okay. Uh, and uh, and then Pawan is probably a better person to ask. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I take it back. The, uh, the landscape of models is so large that it's like kind of, I find it hard to know what to, which ones I should pay attention to and which ones I shouldn't. 
Okay. Okay. Do you want to transition chairs so we can open the discussion section? Okay.